All right, Rachel, Jared, okay, if I go ahead and get this party started. Let's do it. Awesome. Cool. Well, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Uh, good morning, I guess, just barely if you're on the West Coast. And if you're watching the recording, I hope you're having a, a good day no matter where and when you are. We are here to talk about storytelling. We're going to talk about how to help uh, donors understand the value of their dollar that they are giving to, you, to your nonprofit. Storytelling. This is going to be a good one. I'm so excited. I'm Steven. I'm over here at Bloomerang, and uh, I'll be moderating today's discussion as always. And just some quick housekeeping items, just want to let you all know that we are recording this session. So if you have to leave early, maybe get interrupted, or you got another meeting, or maybe a toddler interrupts you or something like that, don't worry. We will get that recording to you later on today. We'll send you the slides, all the resources. You won't miss a thing, I promise. Just be on the lookout for an email from me later on this afternoon. Uh, uh, but most importantly, We'd love to hear from you over the next hour or so. We're gonna to try to save some time for Q&A at the end. So don't be shy, don't sit on those hands. There's a chat box and a Q&A box. You can use either of those, no problem. We'll keep an eye on both, uh, but we'll try to get to just as many questions as we can before the three o'clock Eastern hour. If we don't get to your question, we still love you. We're not playing favorites. Um, maybe we can uh, connect with you afterwards. Send us a tweet. We'll keep an eye on the Twitter feed as well. But bottom line is we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, welcome. We do these webinars every Thursday. We love doing these webinars. This is our ninth year. I think we're over 500 sessions. Uh, wow, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's been very lucky for me to be able to listen in on those. And it's nice to see some returning names. I know a lot of you have been watching these webinars. But if you're new, if you never heard of Bloomerang, in addition to these webinars, we are a provider of donor management software. That's kind of our core thing. So if you are interested in that, or maybe you're gonna be shopping for software, or just curious, check out our website. There's a ton of stuff that you can watch, download, and uh, you know get to know us a little bit more. But don't do that right now. Wait until a little bit later on this afternoon because I hope you all took your vitamins this morning because your brain is gonna get a workout here, I promise you, over the next hour or so. Uh, very pleased to be welcoming back uh, two good friends of the program. We've got Rachel and Jarrett joining us from Mighty Citizen down in beautiful uh, Austin, Texas. Rachel, Jarrett, how you doing? You doing okay? Doing good. Doing great. Yeah. Doing great. Thanks, Stephen. I love it. It's great to have you two. We've been, uh, been chit-chatting. Some of you got to listen to that, so sorry if we were too dorky, but... Uh, Wow. Uh, Rachel, For yourself, Steven. yeah, I love it. Um, <laughs> Rachel and Jarrett, they both been on the webinar series uh, independently, but they're teaming up. And I was telling them before that I always get really good feedback from their sessions and I could see people's kind of heads exploding in the chat during their, their presentations. And that's when it was just one of them, but now they're going <laughs> to do it together. So you all are really in for a, a treat. Two of the smartest people I know in, in the business it, particularly when it comes to digital storytelling. Check out Mighty Citizen. They do really good work. We've got some mutual uh, customers. I can vouch for the great stuff they do. It's a major, major brand names that they're helping out, uh, as well as um, our favorite small and medium-sized nonprofits that we love too. Uh, Rachel over there, she's a chief marketing officer. Jarrett, uh, a writer by by trade, uh, just a uh, amazing mind. I was, I was, I was bragging on you, Jarrett, last week when I was uh, intro or promoing this one that uh, you really gave my brain a workout when we were talking about neuroscience last time. Uh, but uh, wow, I'm excited. And I've taken up way too much time away from you too. So I'm going to let you bring up the slides, I think, Rachel. So I'll yeah. stop sharing. Do that right let now. you. It's always a fun transition. Okay. okay. So I look good. It's working. Yeah. Take it away, okay. my friend. Well, thank you, Stephen. It's always a treat to do a webinar with you and we love Bill Mering, so thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna be talking about storytelling today, specifically storytelling for impact. So helping our donors understand the value of their dollar. We're gonna start with a hypothetical auction. Those of you that have done silent auctions might recognize this a little bit. I'm gonna show you three items and I want you to use the chat box, which hopefully you're familiar with now and tell me how much you would pay for each of the items. So the first item, let me, Get over to the right place here. Is this jar of Hellman's mayonnaise? It's tiny, it's kind of yellowing, 
put in the chat how much you would pay for it. It's those little um, mayonnaise jars that you get at uh, the fancy hotel when you order in. Okay, so people are saying dollar fifty cents. Somebody said gross nothing. Um, yeah, I, I want to say the photo is making it look yellow, but who really knows? Okay, so we've established very little for this mayonnaise. Second item, it's a peace and love teddy bear. Um, perfect for all the Grateful Dead fans in your life. I'm seeing a dollar, two dollars, pass. <laughs> five dollars, somebody said five dollars. Um, okay, okay. Third item, the world's saddest egg whisk. He does not want to whisk his friends, his cousins. Oh, ten dollars. Love it. Okay, okay, so the egg whisk wins for the highest amount you would pay. Okay, so why would I be showing you these items? In 2009, a journalist bought 200 items, which he calls insignificant objects on eBay. And he bought 200 items for $250, so very cheap for each one. Um, he then asked 200 writers to write a story for each of the items. So basically one writer per story. He then put all of those 200 items back up for sale on eBay and they sold for $8,000. $8,000, y'all, whoa. Um, now, before you run off and start a new job at eBay or like start a new career, Jarrett and I are going to spend the next 60 minutes walking you through how he took these objects from insignificant to significant because clearly, you know, they went from not costing very much to costing quite a bit more. Now, if you're curious how much each of those items sold for, believe it or not, the Hellman's mayonnaise was the winner, cost $51 at the end, $25 for the Peace and Love teddy bear, and $30 for the egg whisk. If you're curious about this story and this experiment or want to read some of the stories, they're available at insignificant, or sorry, I have a note here that says significantobjects.com. I hope that's accurate. If it's not there, then maybe it's at insignificant objects. I think it's significantobjects.com. Okay, so there's a lot of conversation around um, storytelling. Uh, we're going to talk about storytelling today. Um, we're not going to talk about tips and tricks so much as like, really understanding how to get stories to stick in the minds of your audiences so that they remember them and think of you. Um, Anthony DeMello says the shortest distance between truth and a human story, or sorry, a human being is a story. And I think this is really important. It reminds us that we are human beings telling human stories to other humans. It's really easy, especially it feels like right now, to discount people or get stuck in like numbers and scale and click-through rates and bounce rates. But in the end, we're writing human stories about humans for other humans. And we are emotional creatures, which Jared's going to talk more about. Um, but that's how we, you know, we've been telling stories for thousands of years. So by the end of the session today, you will be able to articulate why stories are so powerful. I feel like we've done that. Yes, the story. So the story, I see some questions in the chat. Um, the stories were about the objects and many of them um, personified the objects for example, so gave them personalities or characters. Um, we're also gonna find good stories within your organization, talk about how to source those, where to go for those, uh, identifying what makes a good story. So we'll talk about plot twists and things like that. And then we'll also take a look at some examples of really good storytelling, especially in the digital realm, since so much of us are having to do that right now. So I'm Rachel Clemens, I'm CMO at Mindy Citizen. If you guys are not familiar with Mighty Citizen, we offer branding, digital, and marketing services for mission-driven organizations, primarily nonprofits, associations, higher ed, and government. And so we help our clients increase their revenue, boost their awareness, and improve their communities. Um, and we do that through all kinds of different outlets. Um, I'm joined today by Jarrett, who is my partner in crime over at Mighty Citizen. Jarrett, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> our mighty little marketing team, That's Rachel. Right. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Jarrett Way. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, again, I'm the marketing manager here at Mighty Citizen uh, down in beautiful Austin, Texas. Uh, strength of mine is building connections through stories and storytelling. I love storytelling. I really enjoy writing and telling stories. I love telling the story of Mighty Citizen and I love helping mission-driven organizations tell their stories. A uh, weakness of mine is breakfast tacos. Never met a breakfast taco I didn't like. so. <laughs> Uh, and Rachel can definitely attest to that. Rachel, I was, I was laughing really hard because uh, whenever you put up that mayonnaise, someone said, you, you have to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way about mayonnaise. I'm not a mayonnaise yeah. fan. <laughs> uh, but today, 
uh, I want to start off just by talking about three unsolicited opinions on stories told by nonprofit organizations. So I have three opinions that I want to share with you today. The first of is hey, opinion number one is that nonprofits don't tell enough stories. So I, before this presentation, took an informal poll of all of my coworkers, my great team at Mighty Citizen, and I asked them to name the first nonprofit that they thought of. Uh, and here picture are the, the nine that they listed, the first nine. And you can see that it includes a mix of national and local organizations. So you can see, you know, American Cancer Society, Ronald McDonald House Charities, uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, some really noticeable um, nonprofit names. So of these nine nonprofit organizations, only four of them had stories front and center on their website. Four of them had no stories front and center on the website, and one of them had one story buried at least one page deep into the website. So for all intents and purposes, we'll say that four and a half of these nine nonprofit organizations had stories somewhere accessible on their websites. Now, these are all wonderful, important nonprofits doing really good work, um, but only half of them talk almost solely in these claims, and these stats, and these big ideas, and they aren't telling stories and they aren't putting the stories front and center on their website. So just generally, I wish, my wish for nonprofits everywhere is that they spent the vast majority of their public facing fundraising efforts finding and telling stories. My second opinion, nonprofits too often substitute data and claim making for storytelling. So nonprofits are increasingly good at collecting and sharing data, right? So whether that's in the form of an infographic or an annual report, um, statistics sprinkled across your fundraising emails, anything like that. The thing is, y'all, that data, it isn't the whole story, right? Data does not tell the whole story. It doesn't have any sort of relatable hero for your audiences, right? And what's worse than that is publishing infographics and data that don't have any sort of context, right? They don't help uh, the perspective or the current donor understand why the numbers that you're showing them even matter in the first place. So I'm gonna give you a good example of someone that really broke it down. And this is a great example from the Austin American Statesman right here in Austin. And it's from May, 2015. It's our newspaper. And if anyone was in Austin in May, 2015 or knows someone who was, you probably heard that it rained a ton in May, 2015 in Austin. Uh, specifically, it rained 35 trillion gallons of water in Austin in May, 2015. And that is a lot of rain, but the average person just cannot conceptualize, right? The, the sheer amount that is 35 trillion gallons of water. So the Austin American Statesman did a really great job of using these infographics to kind of break it down so that their readers could really conceptualize it. So you see on the left, 35 trillion gallons of water is enough to cover the entire state of Texas in eight inches of water. On the right, it's enough to supply the entire world's population with 10,000 days of water if everyone drank eight eight ounce glasses of water per day. And they could have even gone a step further here because 10,000 days, that's not that great. That's not that easy for everyone to conceptualize. And that's 27 years, by the way. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about claim making, like I said. So as marketers and communicators, we often make claims, right? We say, you know, we do X. We're known for doing X, Y, and Z. We make these claims about our organizations. Uh, for example, you might say, last year we helped this many students, or we created this many programs, or this many people signed up. And while claim making is part of the equation, I often see organizations try to use it to stand in as some sort of persuasive communication, right? And that's just not the case, because when you're making claims, you're doing the opposite, really. It's not particularly persuasive at all. When you make a claim, in fact, you're asking your audience to argue with you, right? You're, you're not necessarily asking them to disagree with you, but you're asking their brains to fire up their rational functions just by making a claim. We know that people don't tend to react to something as much when they are firing off with logic. What we want them to do is to fire off with emotion, right? So whenever you make a claim, you're almost literally inviting them in to challenge what you're saying. And that's not where you want your audiences to be. Now, a little bit on storytelling. In storytelling, you want to take your audiences, your readers, your users, whatever, on a journey. 
You want them to see your perspective, why you care so much about your organization and your mission. When you tell your story, you're creating this kind of simulation in your audience's brain, right? The, the human mind is wonderful. It's crazy. I, Stephen was talking about the whole presentation I gave on the human mind. But the one thing to remember about it is that it is a simulation machine. So when you tell a story, whoever hears or reads that story cannot help but recreate it in the mind. So every time you tell a story about your organization, you're painting this vivid picture about who you are and what you do for anyone who reads or hears it. My last opinion, opinion number three. When nonprofits do tell stories, the stories often seem to repeat themselves. Now, the point I want to make overall and overwhelmingly about this is that this is a very, very normal challenge for marketers and communicators. For example, if you are a nonprofit that provides equitable education to children, maybe, uh, then you might often find yourself telling the same story over and over. It's the same kind of flow, right? Uh, Michael was a third grader who attended a public school that didn't have the same equitable access as other schools. And we stepped in, we helped, he thrived, and now he's doing well. Or maybe Sandra was a citizen advocate and she fought for policy change and she drove changes for her neighborhood school. And today, children are getting the education they deserve. You're telling the same types of stories over and over and over. And what I say to that is that if you feel like you're saying the same things over and over and over. One thing that Rachel and I always say is that your audiences, the people who you interact with, are not thinking about you nearly as much as you are thinking about you. Think about it this way. Here's the deal. You spend 40 hours a week, at least, at least, some of you much more than that, running these teams to produce this content, to talk about your story, absolutely entrenched in what your organization is doing. You think about your organization all the time. Your audiences, the individuals that you're trying to reach, they're not thinking about you even a fraction of that much. So if you feel like you're saying something too much, you could probably stand to say even more. I'm here to tell you that. And I'll turn it back over to Rachel. I lost the little there. bar that like, lets me in <laughs> me. I was like, where is it? Um, okay, so Jared teed that up really nicely for me because we're going to be talking about how you can identify good stories in your organization. And the first thing to note, just to put out there, which is exactly what Jared just did, is finding uh, those stories and understanding that you have a curse of knowledge. So Jared mentioned this, and basically that says that once you know something, it's near impossible to imagine what it's like not to know it. So um, again, you're living and breathing your organization, you are in the work. Um, and they just don't think about you like you do. You know all the jargon, but of course there's this huge gap between what you know and what your organization knows, or sorry, what your audiences know about you. Jarrett and I often, we edit each other's work, which is always a good practice, but sometimes our comments will be like, this feels like curse of knowledge, meaning back up and explain this a little bit more because I, I noticed that we're talking about it as if they automatically know what we're talking about. So just keep that in mind that, you know, when you're sharing information, it is colored with your own experience. I'll give you an example of this. Oh, come on. Okay, so I donated to an organization um, probably over the summer, and I got this email from them. And at the top, or as part of the email, it says, Rachel, I know you, a dedicated member of our Compass Collective, are right there with us supporting refugees during this pandemic. And I was reading the email and I was like, Compass Collective? What is this? It sounds like I'm a part of it, but I don't even know what it is. Turns out that my donation put me into an affinity group, which they had mailed me some information about, but I had not received the mail piece yet. But they just assumed that I knew what the Compass Collective was. And as far as I know, I didn't get any communications about it. So just keep in mind that sometimes you know things that your audience doesn't quite know yet. Now, when you're thinking about what kind of stories to tell, there are certain plots that never fail. So I'm gonna give you three of them. We're gonna talk about them and just think about your organization as I run through these. The first is David and Goliath. This is the classic plot. It's one that is used a lot in nonprofit storytelling. It's really common. Um, this is the underdogs, the rags to riches, the um, sheer triumph over you know, excruciating power. Um, and this tells us some story of someone who's overcome incredible odds to win the day. 
most nonprofits have some of these stories. Certainly you might look at your client stories, volunteer stories and see how they may be the David and what your Goliath or who your Goliath is. It's not always a person. So keep that in mind. Um, and these are probably like immediately you're probably like, okay, we've got some of those stories. The next one is the odd couples. And I love these because they're the two things you would never put together. It's kind of like um, how you can watch a kitten riding a turtle's back on YouTube for like five minutes because it's just so cute. And it's like, what is happening? Um, there's one video of a pig rescuing a goat that I was so in love with. The goat fell in the water and the pig went and rescued it. And then I found out it was fake. I was so sad. I still watch it when it comes up in my memories on Facebook because it's so cute. But anyway, I divert. Um, the odd couples plot shows how a massive gap is being bridged. And so that gap is usually how two people are coming together and they may not seemingly fit together. So they might have socioeconomic, cultural, ethnic, generational or geographical differences. And yet they have um, their forces that have come together to achieve more than they could on their own. So this is often a story of two maybe seemingly surprising um, efforts or, or causes or organizations or people that come together to make great change. So maybe you've got volunteers again, maybe you've got, maybe it's a public private kind of situation. So just think about with your org, do you have some odd couples? The next plot is the MacGyver plot. I'm pretty sure everybody knows that MacGyver was a TV show in the 90s and he was a kind of guy, he was kind of like a James Bond character and he would solve problems for the government and he could um, make do with like very limited resources. Like he could basically build a bomb with toothpaste and a paperclip. Um, there was a MacGruber skit for the younger ones in the audience on SNL. I think uh, Jared always says, oh yeah, MacGruber. <laughs> so um, <laughs> this plot is really about someone uh, making a mental breakthrough or having an innovation or solving a longstanding puzzle. They're often um, inventing new rules or bucking the system or fighting the status quo. Um, lots of times people find these stories really compelling, um, especially if you're an organization that's doing things differently than other organizations in your space, or maybe you're fighting this giant, you know, um, issue, then you probably have some good MacGyver stories. Now, these are the three plots that I want you to think about within your organization, and you uh, can use them over and over again and just change up the details. So uh, most people won't realize you're telling a MacGyver plot over and over again. They're just gonna remember the details from the story. So as long as you switch that up, it should be pretty good. Okay, how do you collect these stories within your organization? So I'm gonna assume that each week, maybe each month, you have a staff meeting. I want you to see if you can carve out a little five minutes in that staff meeting each week or month to ask your staff members, whom did we turn away this week? Was there someone that we were not able to help for whatever reason? Was it a lack of funds and fundraising would help? You know, what's getting in our way? Um, and tell me their stories. Was it a person, a school? Um, who are you not serving and why? Ask them, who's your favorite client? So there's just pe there's people that you just love in your organization. They bring a lot of energy. They have interesting stories. Um, what's their backstory? So can you know, do they have some something interesting to share with your audiences? Um, why do they stick out in your mind? It could be a volunteer, it could be a client, it could be any number of people. And then lastly, who can't you get out of your mind? Um, maybe it's a squeaky wheel. Maybe it's a, um, uh, you know, a particular person. Maybe it's someone you couldn't help. Um, who do you find yourself thinking of over and over again? So ask this of your staff, and then you're going to need to like, you know, get together with them to get more of the story. Because again, you don't want to take up too much time in the meeting. Um, I will often recommend too that your fundraising, the head of fundraising and the head of uh, communications, if they're not the same person, that that person takes or those people take your programs, uh, head of programs out to lunch when you can do that again, or, you know, in a virtual meeting meet with them like once a month and just get a little bit more detail on um, some of the client stories and what's happening in their world because we can be a little bit removed uh, from the day-to-day -day. and so that's a good idea to you know kind of get them together. I have to mention ethics and storytelling um, you know we could do probably a whole session on this but it is important to make sure that your hero the person that your story is about has a say in the story and what is happening around their photo. So you should consider them a contributor and an editor 
to the story. Um, that includes captions, making sure that you have captions in place um, so that people um, have a better context for what's happening in the imagery that you're showing and aren't just kind of coming and fielding their own impressions. Um, and so I have some additional resources for you guys around ethics and storytelling. And these are straight from other nonprofits who have um, established kind of resources for how they treat ethics and storytelling. Um, the first is Save the Children's The People in the Pictures. This is a download. We're going to share these slides. Um, so you'll be able to click to that and get their PDF. And then um, also Dohas um, out of Ireland, their code of contact on co code of conduct on images and messages. I'm going to hand it back over to Jarrett to tell us what makes for a good story. Thank you, Rachel. So what does make for a good story? It's four things. <laughs> Sorry, let me get situated. Four things. So we have first, a hero. Secondly, a guide. There would be a readability and we have emotions. So let me just go through these. Before we go into hero, I wanna make this point that not every story needs a villain, but your stories absolutely need a villain. And villains can take many different forms. It can literally be a person or it can be something structural or a systemic problem. Um, it can be history, it can be the way things are, like the status quo, um, it can be the weather, your villain. Uh, but for most of us, um, our villains are usually apathy. It's this lack of concern, right? It's, it's a lack of concern around the very mission that you are so passionate about. And we tell stories because we want people to be understanding of something or to engage or to sign up or donate or join or whatever or volunteer. If we as organizations can make this connection between our stories and something greater than that, then they become something that's much more effective as a persuasive tactic. So like I said, every story needs a hero and a hero is the person who's driving that positive change, right? So I wanna hear from all of you in the chat box, who is the hero of the stories that your organization tells? Who is a hero of the stories that your organization tells? Give me just a few seconds. Great answers, everyone. I love to see it. No one is saying what I don't want them to say. All right, so you are never the hero. Your organization is never the hero. Now it's our nature to cast our organizations as a hero but the reality is, everyone, that's difficult for your readers to relate to an organization, but they can relate to a person, right? So if the person that you serve is the hero, then how does your organization show up in the story that you're telling, right? Well, in every great hero story, that hero has a guide. So Star Wars fans that might be on, on the presentation, who's the hero here? It's Luke Skywalker, right? But who would he be lost without? Who is Luke Skywalker's guide? That's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Another example for you Harry Potter fans out there, who's the hero in Harry Potter? It's right there, it says that it's Harry Potter. <laughs> and who is the guide in Harry Potter? And that is Albus Dumbledore, absolutely. So the third thing I said on the list of four was readability, right? And the reality is that many of your stories will be written down, and that means that they have to be readable. Now, something that I learned pretty early in my career that is still a shocking fact to me is the simple fact that the average American adult reads at a certain grade level, and that grade level is an eighth grade grade level, which means that 50 over 50% 50 of adults can't comprehend or read a book uh, written at or above an eighth grade grade level. So to give you some examples of books at an eighth grade grade level are The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald and The Firm by John Grisham, just to give you two examples. And The Firm is a fantastic movie uh, starring Tom Cruise based in Memphis, Tennessee. You should watch it if you haven't. I want to add, Jarrett, that the chat, people were getting this one for sure. I, normally we see like 10th grade, 12th mm -hmm. grade. People nailed it with like fifth grade, fifth to eighth grade and things like that. So that's yeah. great. I think it is something that is starting to become a little more common knowledge. But as marketers and communicators for mission driven organizations that tell stories, it's something that you, you have to be aware of because if you're writing it, you're doing yourself a disservice if 
if half the people that you want to to read it aren't getting you know, their full experience, but you could just write it at a lower grade level, which brings me to my next point about readability scores and how to reduce the readability level of your story. So there are a few ways to reduce readability. And the very first one is most effective, in my opinion, as a copy editor, and that is to shorten your sentences. The easiest way to quickly lower the readability of anything you write is to shorten the sentences. And you might find in your writing style that you often use longer sentences, and that's something that you can be aware of as you move on. Secondly is to shorten the length of your words. So if you use a lot of words with you know more than three syllables, three or more syllables, that uh, works against you for most readability scores. Third is to add more paragraph breaks. So this is just simply the way that the copy looks on the page, right? If someone is reading it, if it's broken up with more paragraph breaks, that automatically makes it a little bit more readable. Next is to add more textual interest. So if you are uh, building, you know, these stories in your CMS or wherever you publish them, if you have the opportunity to add some treatments like pull quotes or relevant images or lists, you should absolutely do it because that helps, again, just like with the paragraph breaks, it helps make it more readable on the page, the way it looks. By the way, one really great tool that we use at Mighty Citizen for readability is called readable.com, readable.com. Um, we are not paid whatsoever to, to say this. I just love it because I use it daily every time I write something really um, just to make sure that it meets the, the grade level that we wanted at or it's, it's below that. So readable.com is a great tool. Um, there is a free version where you can put in just a little excerpt of, of your full body copy um, just to see how you're doing. So moving on storytelling, I want to make this point. Humans do not act without emotions. And there are four major human emotions, and that is clad, sad, mad, and then for the sake of rhyming, a frad or afraid. I always laugh at that. Not a typo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so these are the four major human emotions. And of course, there are other emotions that humans feel, but they're all typically shades or combinations of two or more of these four. So which of these is the most compelling in your storytelling and eliciting you know, a reaction from your target audiences? That's fear. Fear is the biggest motivator with mad following behind. If people are afraid, they tend to act. And that is not me at all saying to you to, to I'm, not, I'm not trying to encourage anyone to be manipulative here, right? You don't need to create any fear where there isn't any. We have plenty of that in the world right now. but you do want to acknowledge fear if it exists and if you're able to help dispel some of it as an organization, you absolutely should do that. Let me give you an example. So this, this ad you see is from the Truth Campaign. Uh, you probably recognized it from early 90s. It's been around for at least two decades now. Um, and they focus on a really emotional uh, message around teen smoking, anti-teen smoking rather. And this particular campaign leans a little bit on that fear and anger I was talking about. It leans on that emotion to get people to act or to not act um, and to not start smoking. And in this particular campaign with the Truth Initiative, uh, you might remember this ad, they, they rolled up this big white van to Philip Morris headquarters, the front steps, you know, big tobacco. And they start unloading these body bags onto those steps. And it was essentially a message saying, the, this is how many people your products kill, I think it was per day, just trying to make that statement clearly very, a very calculated emotional message that they were trying to get out. And again, that's from the, the Truth Initiative. So now we have this other campaign that started around the same time as you started to see these Truth Initiative campaigns. And this one was called Think, Don't Smoke. Now this campaign is an ad, again, against teen smoking. And in this campaign, there is a teen smoking a cigarette Another teen comes up and says, hey, man, that's not cool. Smoking makes your breath stink and it makes your teeth yellow. Um, so this campaign, as opposed to the more emotional one, was much more logical, right? It's, it's simply stating, if you smoke, X, Y, and Z will happen to you. By the way, this campaign was run by Philip Morris. They were forced to run an anti-teen smoking ad when they lost this big high-profile lawsuit back in the 90s. So why the heck would Big Tobacco, Philip Morris, run a campaign against teen smoking 
and quite literally say, think, don't smoke in this campaign. Well, let me show you the conversion rates of both of these campaigns. In these examples, again, we have this emotional campaign on the left and the truth initiative, and this very logical one on the right, stink, don't smoke. Teens only exposed to the truth campaign were 66% less likely to smoke. And the teens only exposed to the logical campaign on the right were 36% more likely to smoke. Now, is there causation? It's hard to say, but did Philip Morris intend to get more teens to smoke with their campaign? I'll leave that to you to decide. But what we do know is that an emotional campaign succeeded in its efforts where a logical one didn't. And that is the power of these two different ways of thinking emotional versus logical that, that your audience is looking in. And Rachel, I will turn it back over to you. Yeah, all right. So let's take a look at who is doing it well. Um, the first example is from Charity Water. It's kind of a cheat to share Charity Water because they're so good at everything they do. But one of the things that they do really well that maybe doesn't get noticed as much is that they share stories on their website. In fact, they have a whole section on stories that's full of stories. And so um, they do a great job of sharing how you know, creating a well in a village does more than just give people clean water. So this is a story of Natalia um, and she lives in a village and her one of her jobs as part of the family is to go collect water. And so previously she was having to, you know, walk miles every day, go get the water and walk miles back. And because of that, she was missing school a lot. Um, so Charity Water came in and put the well into her village and now because it is so easy to get that water, she is able to attend school. She actually ends up becoming um, the head of her village, which as a 15 year old girl is absolutely amazing. But they tell her story here and one of the things I love about this story is that it has a call to action that goes along with it. And you can see that in the bottom left for each of the stories that they tell on Charity Water. There is a donate now and a see all stories and some share buttons so you can share them on Twitter. A lot of times we'll share stories and they're great, but there's not always an immediate action that comes along with it. And so we want to give people the option to donate when we share our stories as well. This is a campaign for Water is Life. It's actually a Twitter campaign, Twitter fundraising campaign, which you're not it's not a phrase you hear very often. I don't recommend going out and trying to raise money on Twitter. However, they did something really unique and that's why it worked. So they took a common hashtag, first world problems, if you're interested or if you're familiar with that hashtag, and they took actual tweets that use that hashtag and juxtapose that with images from the field. So out in the work that they're doing. So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, this one reads, sat in the front row of the movie theater and now my neck is sore, hashtag first world problems. Clearly not really a problem in the scope of the world. Um, and so they use that to juxtapose against this woman who was wearing, or not wearing, carrying um, lots of chickens on her head. And the call to action reads, donate to help solve real problems, water is life. Another example from the same campaign, my son got the wrong toy in his Happy Meal. Hashtag first world problems. And then again, the call to action to donate to real problems. And they also did a video. I'm not gonna play it for you, but you can check it out on YouTube. Um, and they had people out in the field again, um, reading real world uh, tweets using this hashtag. So this one says, I hate it when my house is so big, I need two wireless routers. And clearly he's standing in front of a home that is not too big. Um, and so with this campaign, they were able to raise over a million dollars during a three month campaign and had 7 million plus views on YouTube. Again, I would not necessarily go out and run a Twitter campaign, but what works here from a storytelling perspective is they're taking something that is very common and uh, understood in one context and twisting it to tell their stories through visuals only in another context. So very interesting though. This is an example from the Equal Justice Initiative. They do a great job with storytelling. This is the story of Joe Sullivan. He committed a, a non-homicide offense when he was 13 and sentenced to life in prison. Um, and with EGI's help, he was released from prison after 25 years. Um, so 
this is on their website and um, you're seeing the repeat so you can see the full length of the article here. But what you'll notice about their story and what they're doing from a great storytelling perspective, the copywriting is really good. But also notice how much content is there about Joe and then EGI's work or their, their part of the story is a much smaller piece at the very end. So they're giving the weight to Joe's story, making him the hero and then following up with how they have helped Joe. One thing they're also doing a really good job of, and this is to the point that Jerry made earlier about not getting sick of your own stuff, <laughs> um, is they repurpose that story in lots of different ways. So we saw the website previously. This is a page from a report called All Children Are Children that's put out by EJI. And so they take Joe's story and they chunk it up into different usage. This is the full a story for this use. And so keep in mind too that, you know, storytelling takes time. We have to go and cover the story. We have to interview people and gather, you know, information about the story. And then we have to write it. So make sure that all that time you're putting into it is um, used to its most full and beautiful use and use it in lots of different ways. In case you're thinking, oh, but those are all big organizations, Rachel. Here's one from an organization called Falls Church McLean Children's Center, and they are a daycare center. And this comes from my friend, Rachel Muir, who is an amazing fundraising consultant. Um, and she is uh, helping them with their email appeal here. And so I just wanna read this language because I think this is a good example of, of, of storytelling and in terms of taking you to a scene. Um, and they're trying to raise money uh, during COVID. So during you know last year, uh, I guess it could still be this year, but it happened to be last year. So this is not a normal year, Rachel, first name. We have fewer children in our classrooms, color tape on the floor and tables indicates places where each child can play safely, distanced. Children and teachers wear masks. And after each time a, a child plays with a toy, draws with an individual set of crayons or assembles a puzzle, teachers whisk it away to be sanitized before the next child can use it. So you can kind of picture that in your head, right? They're kind of running in and getting things because you know kids are impatient. Um, these are the rigorous demands of providing a safe environment for children during the pandemic, and it takes more resources than usual for cleaning supplies, gloves, and towels, but there's good news, you can help. So again, we're telling that story, we're using colorful language, and then we're also um, telling them that they can help, and there's a call to action in there as well. Um, this is some work for humanity and inclusion. And full disclosure, this is Mighty Citizen work. So um, this is not a sales pitch, but I'm just going to tell you about it because I think it's an interesting way to think about how to know which stories are resonating most with your audiences. So if you're not familiar with humanity and inclusion, they serve those impacted by war and disabilities. Um, in fact, they clear landmines and they won a Nobel Prize for it uh, many years ago. They wanted to raise awareness um, of their mission in America. So they are based in France. They're very well known in France. In fact, they have a 65% um, awareness in France. In America, it's 6%. So much different landscape. And they really wanted to get their message out so that they could eventually start fundraising. So the initial goal was to raise awareness of their mission so that they could get people interested and in, to ultimately lead to fundraising. Because we all know we can't just like buy a list or, or you know, contact people immediately and ask them to give. We have to show them and nurture them and, and continue to give them reason to give. So um, they didn't have a big budget. So uh, what we did was decide to set out and figure out which stories that they had would resonate with Americans who live in a country where um, many of them don't, you know, we don't see war day to day. We don't have, we have a very different life than most of the people that HI is serving. Um, so we decided that we would take a couple of different approaches to the storytelling and test those on social media. And we could use a small budget to test a couple different messages and see which one would resonate best. So sometimes keep in mind too, that you can use a little testing. We can use digital means to figure out which of our storytelling is actually reaching our audiences in ways that matter. Um, and so we were trying to determine, you know, which, which of these would get people to click, sign a petition or sign up for a newsletter, and then ultimately to fundraise. And there was some fundraising that happened as well. So this first campaign, we, I'll show you two that we tried out for them. The first one here is a prisoner of war concept. Um, it takes a common phrase, kind of like first world problems, and twists it a little and gives it new terms. So this is the story of Zmina. Zmina was putting her son to bed when in an instant she was left injured and childless. Zmina is a prisoner of war. And the text there that she is saying is, I put my son to bed. So again, we're trying to get Americans to pay attention to what's happening. And this is something that many Americans do every night. I put my son to bed every night. Um, so really trying to get me to stop my scroll and my social and pay attention. 
Um, and uh, so this is one example. I can tell you that this example, the next example I'm gonna show you um, had more clicks, had more uh, petitions signed, had more email signups. This one actually raised more money. So sometimes the campaigns that are gonna raise awareness are a little bit different from the campaigns that are gonna raise more money. So just an example there. The other campaign um, or message that we were testing for um, humanity inclusion was around uh, this idea of, it's called the wardrobe. It's very difficult to read. I'm a little like ee, reading out loud because it's hard to stomach. But again, we're trying to reach Americans that are scrolling through their social very quickly. And so um, this campaign is around the idea of dismemberment. And, and this first one reads, get 50% off the worst moment of his life. Stepping on a landmine should mean a great deal to you. The calls to action say horrified, so are we. Donations prevent detonations. And uh, you see in this example, there's a donate now button. Um, this had the effect of stopping people in their scrolls. Um, it, we did test it internally with some uh, friendly audiences or people that were familiar with HIM give their honest opinion. Um, and you know, decided to run it. So again, the goal was to raise awareness and this campaign definitely does that. Um, this one reads, she didn't know she would step on a landmine when she picked out her outfit. Now there's no taking the war out of her wardrobe. So there was some commentary on the post. One person said, I like this post. I've been online window shopping so much lately. This was last, last fall. Uh, going to the site and seeing the way they presented important information in the same format as those fast fashion sites really messed with my brain and woke me up a little. Thanks. So again, we're trying to twist something that people are used to seeing. Oh, and I did mention this one, uh, this campaign was more effective from an awareness standpoint, people signing petitions to fight landmines, um, signing up for information. So again, later they'll be fostering that, those audiences for fundraising. Here's another example from a smaller organization. This is uh, Literacy First. They do K through second grade literacy to get kids ready for a third grade reading level. Traditionally, they are funded by the University of Texas. So a little bit different funding model, but you know, anybody who's funded by the state or some version of the state knows that you know, eventually you're gonna have to kind of look at raising your own money, that they're not always, you know, uh, the money is not always there in the same way. And so they were really looking to increase fundraising from individuals specifically. What I love about this is this is their own imagery. Obviously it's not stock photography and it tells the story you see the care and the relationships between the um, tutors and the students in these images. They also do a great job of storytelling. Um, so uh, their story here is making Kelsey, one of their volunteers or their tutors, the hero. And they're talking about this child. And I saw some uh, mention in the chat about like, how do you tell stories for people that want to be anonymous? So this talks about this child. It never shares her name. Um, but what I love about this story, and, and this is from their website, is again, it's very visceral. You feel it, you know it. Um, it says she's kicking her pink shoes against her chair leg while she's reading, and the flashing lights on her shoes are blinking nonstop while she sounds out each word on the page. I can picture that. Anybody who's been around a child with those blinking light shoes knows exactly what's happening here. And just the fact that she's a child, she's moving and she's learning. Um, so this feels very visceral to me and they do a great job with that. They also use video for storytelling. We, we could have gone into a whole you know, session on that as well. Um, they do these great day in the life videos that are done by their tutors. Um, and so these are young people in the AmeriCorps program. They've got a lot of skills. Um, so this, you know, the opening scene of this is down the hallway of a classroom or sorry, a school and it, you can smell it like it it looks like every school we've ever seen. They do a good job of sort of tracking their day so you know where your money is going. And then they do a great job of thank you letters as well. I just want to mention this. Um, you know, most of you are fundraisers and so saying thank you is really important. Um, they did a day of giving and uh, Rachel, who was their director of development, um, immediately sent thank yous to everyone who donated uh, really personally right away. And then they also called a few weeks later to leave a voicemail or well, to speak to people, but most people don't answer their phones. So they left a voicemail, you know, just thanking me as a donor. And then they also sent a follow-up email that says, we just called to say we love you. Again, you don't see this much thank you normally and it really has an impact. And then lastly, I have to share with you guys the story of Perdita. So it's not just people that have stories. We kind of alluded to that earlier with the idea of the egg whisk having a background. Um, so 
This is the story of Perdita, the world's worst cat. And I'll read you the uh, social post that went along with Perdita. So it says, meet Perdita, not for the faint of heart. Likes, staring into your soul until you feel as if you may never be cheerful again. The song, Cat Scratch Fever, the movie Pet Cemetery. Jump scares, her specialty. Lurking in dark corners, being queen of her domicile, fooling shelter staff into thinking she's sick. Vet agrees, she's just a jerk. Dislikes include the color pink, kittens, so chipper, dogs, children, the Dixie Chicks, now the Chicks, Disney movies, Christmas, and last but not least, hugs. See, she's single and ready to be socially awkward with a socially awkward human who understands personal space, free adoption. So <laughs> she just looks evil. Um, Perdita was swiftly uh, 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 adopted, she just couldn't get that word out swiftly adopted um, and you know clearly they gave her a lot of personality. A few takeaways from today, stories are uh, more persuasive than claim making. Jarrett told us about that because they force the audience to experience things from our point of view. Again, we are simulation machines. So tell us a good story and we can imagine it. Uh, constantly be on the lookout for stories, including popular plots like David and Goliath, The Odd Couples and MacGyvers. A good story includes a hero, a guide, usually you, a readability and emotion. And great storytelling can happen through imagery, uh, photography only, hashtags, um, or just one sentence. So keep in mind that storytelling does not have to be especially onerous. If you're curious about more storytelling resources, um, these are a couple of books we really like. One is Building a, brand, a Story Brand, and the other is Made to Stick. And we use some examples from the Made to Stick today. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Stephen for questions. Um, you can get the slides. I think Stephen's going to be sharing them as well. Um, and they're available at mightycitizen.com slash storytelling. When you go there, we have a couple other things that might be a good follow-up to this content. Uh, one is how to write effective web copy. That's an on-demand webinar from a previous session. And it's all about writing for the web, especially, which is very different from print. And then we also have an editorial content calendar, very um, timely as we're in January. And so if you made a resolution to finally get that calendar in place, we have a template you can use for that. Um, okay, I think I'll hand it over to Stephen for questions. I told you it was gonna be a good one. That was awesome. <laughs> I, I, one thing I forgot to say, one thing I really love about Rachel and Jared is chock full of examples. I should have I should have warned people that there was going to be some real life examples. Those, that landmine one. Wow, that stopped me in my tracks. I know um, it's it's tough. That was something. Uh, thank you for doing this. This is great to have you too. Um, I'm seeing a lot of chats coming in. Yes, we did record. We will send the recording and the slides out later today. I promise. Just look for an email from me. We will get you that. Um, but let's do some questions. It, the number one question probably won't surprise either of you was, you know, touching on that HIPAA sensitive um, uh, people being served, you know, children, domestic violence. And you touched on this a little, Rachel, uh, the example you were showing did have a picture. What about in cases where we don't even want to show a picture, not just an anonymous one? Have you seen creative ways of telling those stories without even faces uh, on the piece? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think photography can go a long way. Um, I think about, like, say you're telling a story of a child. Um, I think about, like, hands on a toy or a mm. stuffed animal, like just those things that make childhood that people immediately recognize, especially, you know, if you've got a child in your life, like things you see every day that take on a new meaning perhaps, or just give it relevance, I think is something. Um, another thing is I was going to show an example. I didn't, um, illustration can play a big part here. So, um, you can tell a story through drawings or, um, illustrations. And so they're not as impactful as photography, you know, but when photography is not an option, I think they can help to tell a story and maybe it's the children's illustrations or something. Um, so I think there's some way you got to get a little creative with it. That, that is the, the barrier. Um, but but I think there's ways to maybe try to weave in um, storytelling through the visuals when, when the words aren't necessarily there. I love it. Uh, here's a cool one from Angie about video. You know, we saw a lot of print and photo examples, but have you seen any interesting video that has done this? Is there, uh, uh, does it have to be a super highly produced thing or can a nice cell phone video, maybe you're hearing right from somebody on their webcam or or a cell phone get the job done as well. It seems like maybe the, this day and age you can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, the, Rachel and I 
over the last year at least have gone back and forth about video and its capabilities. I will say this, and Rachel may disagree with me. I think that video is an effective form of storytelling. It often depends on your larger content strategy, which is a whole other thing. But what I will say is that in terms of production quality, the really high end, very like well produced videos to tell your story are great, but there is something to be said about a homegrown iPhone effort to mm. get your story out about your organization. And I think a lot of people relate to authenticity, especially right now. Mm. And if you're an organization that is saying, this is all we can do right now to tell our story, this is what we're passionate about. And this is what we're trying to get the word out about. Record that on your iPhone, do the best you can with it production wise and upload it because getting your story out there and whatever it means you can is better than, than nothing with the resources that you have right now. Um, as far as who's doing it, I totally agree with all of that. And as well as who's doing it well, um, I've seen, it's been a little while, but St. Baldrick's did an amazing video about a little girl named Abby um, who had childhood cancer. And I thought that one was really well done. Um, Charity Water, I hate to say them, but <laughs> you know, not to begrudge them because they're amazing, but um, they do a good job. And then I think the other thing is we see video all the time that's really well done. And it's not necessarily from the nonprofit space. Like there's a lot you can take from just about anybody um, on the video side, meaning like good storytelling is good storytelling, you know, whether it's a nonprofit or not. And Marie also just commented, I just wanted to say real quick, Stephen, mm -hmm. that Gather Voices is a really great tool. Oh, yeah. To, they're awesome. We, we have used it. Yeah. 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 They're, they're, uh, the head of that organization has been on our webinar series. I'll have to pull up that, that webinar, but that they're really good. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And geez, with, with how good cell phones are these days, it's getting to be hard to make something low quality. I mean, this may not yeah. be an issue in a couple of years, you know? That's, That's true. great. Um, what about, you know, we've looked at a lot of organizations that have a very kind of tangible uh, um, service recipient. What about organizations that maybe do like advocacy, research, even environmental, I think, is a, a little bit uh, here on that bubble where there's not, you know, a single person or a hero that can be highlighted. A any advice for those folks? Yeah, I think... Um... You got to get a little, I saw someone ask about arts organizations. That's another one, right? <laughs> Maybe where it's a little different. Um, I think there's still a, a, a way to make it about a person or people. Maybe it's someone mm. that represents uh, a group particularly. I mean, I think about the arts organization specifically. We took my son to see his first Broadway. It was like the Little Mermaid or something. He was probably four or five. I have this amazing photo of him. It had the light coming from the from the you know, stage and he's like, he's just totally in awe. It's amazing. Um, so maybe finding ways to personalize it um, down to someone or like if you're fighting for, um, I just saw Tennessee River is getting cleaned up, right? They're doing an initiative around that. Like, what does that mean for the people who live along the river or um, for the people that get the water source from the river or the people that use it for recreation? I think there are ways to, to come down a little, a little bit more uh, narrow. Um, or maybe to look at it as a generational thing. You know, what does that mean for Gen Z? Or what does that mean for um, people who are raising families in that area? Or I don't know. I, I feel like there's a way to make it a little bit more um, narrow, even if you've got to get a little creative. Yeah, drill layer deep. That makes sense. Um, geez, we're almost out of time. It's already uh, almost one minute till, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but in addition to these awesome resources here, how, how can folks get a hold of, of you two if you are uh, maybe willing to take questions offline? Yes, thank you for asking me that. I actually have our email address this year. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I almost forgot. Um, so yeah, you can email us. Um, we have a lot of writing on storytelling at our website. I'll add in the chat real quick, a, a link to one of those. Um, but if you go to our insights section, which is our, our articles and stuff and just type in storytelling in the search bar, you're gonna get a whole bunch of content uh, related to storytelling that might help answer some questions as well. Nice. Thank you for that. I, I've always loved Jared's uh, email address. I feel like it's the most you know, memorizable. <laughs> <laughs> anyway at man just do it that's great um yeah. yeah and also good twitter follow uh these two as well you might want to do that um did i not see the bernie sanders in these slides yet? i know i don't think I, 
<laughs> I know. Time. I tried. I tried. I tried to get in there. <laughs> next time, we'll make it happen. It was only, we only had a day's notice, but uh, the, the memes will be there next time. Hopefully, that's okay. This was still great. Uh, wow! Thank you both for doing this and, and taking the time. I know you're super busy with your your client work, but thanks for doing this. Of course, thank you. Appreciate yeah, thank it, you, Stephen. Stephen. And thanks to all of you for hanging out. I mean, you also uh, carved time out of your schedule. Wow! I think we had over 800 people. So thank you. We're going to send the slides or recording reach out to these two, follow Mighty Citizen. And uh, if you need some brand help, check them out too. I'll put in a little plug. I don't mind. It's my webinar series. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, we got some, speaking of webinar series, I want to just talk real quick about our next session. Uh, we are back to doing every Thursday. We're getting a little bit more consistent, perhaps uh, more than last year. Uh, not that it was a bad thing, but uh, our buddy Brian Saber is going to be joining us uh, next Thursday, 3 p.m., almost the same time. Uh, so exactly one week from right now. Brian is the master of asking in person. Uh, he's got a really cool framework to help people with different sort of styles and personalities ask in ways that make it comfortable for them. But he's going to zero in on board members specifically. So maybe if you're a board member who struggles with asking for money, if maybe you have a board that you want them to do a little more fundraising, but maybe they're a little nervous about making that ask. This would be a good one. Brian's awesome. It'd be really practical and uh, gets into some, some cool personality uh, difference uh, type things as well. So join us. If you can't make it, sign up anyway, because we'll email you the recording. We don't care. It's fine. Um, <laughs> just like that you'll get on this one. So we'll call it a day there. Like I said, look for an email from me today with all the goodies. Um, and if you're watching the recording now and uh, we somehow missed you with the slides, just email me. It's okay if it's months later. I don't mind. I love it. Um, but hopefully we'll see you again next week. So have a good rest of your Thursday. Have a good weekend. Stay safe. Stay healthy. We need all of you out there. Uh, please stay safe. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye now. Bye. See ya. <laughs>